So good evening and good morning, everyone. Ohayo gozaimasu to our friends in Japan and colleagues uh, in Asia. Um, so I'm Yves Tibergin. I'm a professor of political science here at UBC and the co-director of the Center for Japanese Research, uh, which is under the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at UBC. Um, I'll start by acknowledging that we are meeting today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Muskegon people. Um, I would like to thank uh, Saya, uh, who is here. Um, Saya San is a policy major, uh, IR minor, and her furusato is on Rebun Island, the most beautiful island in Japan, at least on her father's side. Um, and so Saya has been doing most of the work for this event, but we would also like to thank uh, Tina Alexander, Bianca Trey, uh, and the SPPGA staff uh, for all the support for this event. So welcome to everyone. This is the event on Japan's role in the global order at a pivotal time. We're gonna evaluate uh, Prime Minister Abe's legacy, uh, talk about uh, Prime Minister Suga's early steps, and then discuss the post-US election landscape for Japan and for relation between Japan and the world. Uh, this is part of a series. This follows uh, a series of event we did last year on, or earlier this year, on Japan's leadership in the liberal international order. Uh, there is a whole set of articles publication on our website uh, that you can access. And in fact, the four speakers today uh, wrote papers in that series. Uh, and next week, we're very, very pleased to follow today's event with a discussion with Tobias Harris, uh, who is one of the premier, at least outside insiders on Japanese politics. And he just published this uh, very big book on Prime Minister Abe's uh, term. Uh, the iconoclast. So if, if you want to have a lot of inside stories and what's happening within Japanese politics, please join us as well next week. Um, so now it's a great, great honor for me to introduce uh, our four speakers. Um, we, uh, we're going to do this in a very casual way and do a sort of fire chat talk with a series of questions that each of us uh, will answer. Each of them will answer. I'll just ask the questions. Uh, and then later we'll open up to uh, Q&A. Uh, so first, Professor Saori Katada, who is Professor of International Relations at the University of Southern California. Uh, she, you know, she, she has published many, many books and articles, it's actually astonishing, because she's also running a lot of things on the administrative side. But two of the most recent ones, one this year, uh, is called Jap Japan's New Regional Reality, Geoeconomic Strategy in the Asia-Pacific, from Columbia University Press, very relevant for today's event. Uh, another very relevant one was co-published uh, with uh, two other authors in 2017, The Bricks and Collective Financial Statecraft from Oxford University. Uh, next, I'm very pleased to introduce here Dr. Masahiro Kawai from University of uh, Tokyo's GRASP uh, and ERINA. Uh, he also served as the chief economist for the World Bank's East Asia and the Pacific region as Deputy Vice Minister of Finance for International Affairs at Japan's Ministry of Finance, and as President of the Policy Research Institute of Japan's Finance Ministry. Uh, later, he was Special Advisor to the Asian Development Bank uh, uh, in charge of economic cooperation and integration, and then Dean and CEO of the Asian Development Bank Institute, the ADBI, from 2007-2014. Uh, Dr. Kawai has published many, many papers on issues of geoeconomics and um, um, international affairs in East Asia. Uh, Dr. Mireya Salas is the director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies and Knight Chair in Japanese Studies, as well as senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. So Dr. Soyes is joining us from Washington uh, one of her recent books is Dilemmas of a Trading Nation, uh, which received the 2018 Ohira Masayoshi Memorial Award. And this is probably one of the very best book, if not the very best book, on the story of the TPP and the big shift in ja Japan's trading policy. Um, and then Professor Harukata Takenaka-san uh, is a professor at the National Graduate Institute uh, for Policy Studies, known as GRIPS in Tokyo joining us from Tokyo early morning. Uh, his recent publications include Failed Democratization in Pre-War Japan from Stanford University in 2014, 
Futatsu no Seiken Kotai, uh, two changes of government uh, from Tokyo Case of Shobo in 2017. Uh, and a very relevant article for uh, today's presentation, Expansion of the Japanese Prime Minister's Power in a Japanese Parliamentary System uh, from Asian Survey. And I know he just completed another book, uh, but we don't have it yet. So he will come back to introduce <laughs> his book. Um, so uh, for everyone, the chat function has been disabled. Uh, so please ask your question through the Q&A window. Uh, please note that this webinar and the following Q&A session will be recorded. You're not required to use your camera and microphone to participate in a Q&A uh, session. Uh, written questions can be submitted to everyone via this Q&A function. And in fact, uh, there's an upvoting uh, system. So you can submit questions. You can also see the questions submitted by others and vote on them. And the questions with the most votes will go up uh, and I will see them first. Uh, so I will be monitoring this Q&A window uh, and post questions uh, using attendees' first names only. Uh, the Q&A will be mostly uh, after, so in the last 30 minutes. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we're now going to get started. And I will ask a question to each of them, giving them five minutes uh, for this first round. Um, and with hindsight and looking at it from a long-term perspective, what are the three most significant legacies of Prime Minister Abe and maybe one shortcoming when it comes to Japan's role in the global order? I will first ask uh, Harukata-san to answer this question. Okay. So, hold on. Okay. Could, uh, I, I hope everyone can see the slide. Yes, and very thank good. You, uh, okay, great. Thank you very much uh, for having me here uh, this evening or this morning. I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Yves for organizing this webinar and having me today. And it's nice to uh, see uh, my old friends, Saori-san and Amelia-san and Masahiro-san uh, on, on this webinar. So let me referring to uh, let me start by referring to legacies of Prime Minister Abe in the global order, uh, in the global order, in particular to the policies which had contributed to contributing to sustaining and expanding liberal order. And these are um, three uh, three uh, policies. The first is security-related legislation of 2015, which made it possible for Japan to exercise the rights of collective defense. And the second is TPP-11, or also known as CPTPP, uh, signed in 2018, and Japan-EU Economic Partnership Agreement, which was also uh, reached uh, in 2018. And these two agreements are uh, promoted to enhance free trade in East Asia and uh, between Japan and, in, and the EU. And I think uh, Prime Minister uh, Abe exercised a great leadership in leading Japan to conclude uh, these uh, negotiations. And the, last, the third one is uh, free and open in the Pacific vision, um, which was launched by again, Prime Minister Abe in 2016. And this is really um, epoch making in that this is really the first uh, comprehensive vision launched by Japan, which combined the uh, security and economic policies after the World War II. And as for the shortcoming, well, I can think of many shortcomings on the domestic front side, and uh, but then some in bilateral relationships, such as in a Russo-Japan relationship, but I cannot really think of policies that undermined liberal international order. Maybe he could have presented more concrete policy examples of FOIP to make people understand what is what it is really about. And um, I just would like to emphasize that uh, Prime Minister Abe could implement these policies because of institutional changes in Japanese political system uh, since 1990s. And a uh, series of uh, in institutional changes expanded Japanese Prime Minister's power. Uh, for example, uh, political reform of 1994 uh, ex uh, made um, um, made cabinet more cohesive as prime minister came to have more power to discipline LDP backbenchers and factions. 
And Prime Minister expanded his power as the power, uh, as the power of um, Prime Minister's power expanded as the power of endorsement became more effective and the power of distributing uh, political funds more important. And as a result, Prime Minister obtained more discretions in ministerial appointments and uh, came to have po more power to uh, resist, um, resist resistance uh, from, uh, uh, with, from uh, backbenchers. I mean, it, it enabled him to overcome uh, resistance from LDP backbenchers, for example, uh, in such case as opening Japanese agricultural products market to uh, other countries. And um, a 2001 administrative, and there was another reform which was carried out in 2001, which was administrative 2000, uh, 2001. And Prime Minister uh, came to have more authority to, to initiate policies, and uh, he was provided with more uh, powerful organizations to formulate and coordinate policies. For example, uh, Cabinet Secretariat, uh, which is an institution supporting Prime Minister, uh, obtained new power to design policies, and a new policy, a new a new policy, a policy formulation office called Cabinet Office was created. And in addition, uh, there was um, another reform in 2017, uh, so-called National Security Council reform, which created uh, National Security Council and National Security uh, National Secur Security uh, Secretariat in the cabinet, and it made um, it made it possible for the prime ministers to more effectively coordinate uh, policies uh, on. I mean on external and security policies between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Defense. And so these uh, reforms taken together and enabled Prime Minister Abe to uh, coordinate uh, external policies and overcome uh, resistance from LDP backbenchers when he negotiates with other countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Har Harukada-san. So I think that was five minutes. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> yeah, perfect time management. Thank you. So I'm going to turn to Mireya now. And in particular, I'm guessing one of your three contributions is going to be the CPDBP. Uh, and if that is the case, how could Japan turn from, you know, in January when the U.S. pulled out, January 2017, uh, people in Japan were saying there's no way it's going to happen without the U.S., by early spring, Japan was not only back on, on site, but was leading it. So what, what exactly happened? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Eve. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation. And before I jump into the CPTPP discussion, uh, which uh, I, I do have a lot of interest in that point, I want to say that the three issues that I had identified as legacies are very much the same ones as Takenaka-san <laughs> also identified. <laughs> So, but I would add a little bit of um, uh, additional detail to that. And, um, you know, going into the trade question, uh, Eve, that you posed to me, I think that what has been most remarkable of the Abe tenure is that he basically uh, helped Japan become a leader of free trade. And mm -hmm. that's not a phrase we used to use when we talked about Japan. Japan was known for a more passive, defensive uh, uh, position on trade. Always the domestic political constraints prevented Japan from punching really uh, at its weight in international negotiations. As Takinaka-san reminded us, uh, he was able to do this because he was building upon a series of uh, domestic changes that strengthened the office of the prime minister. And he took advantage of that and he pushed that further so that the prime minister's office really became a control tower. It was possible to overcome bureaucratic sectionalism by creating a TPP headquarters, so you did not have the ministries quarreling with one another. That was frequently in the past, and Japan could speak with a very cohesive voice. I think that Japan continued to uh, surprise many um, of its counterparts in the TPP negotiations, even the original ones. Um, you probably remember, Eve, that when Japan first joined the TPP, there was a lot of skepticism as to where Japan would not drag its way, and therefore the TPP negotiations would never close. And actually, Japan was the last country to join the TPP, what came very well prepared and actually became a very important um, force uh, to support the United States in many of its positions during negotiation. Um, and one last point on the domestic political constraints, I think it's important to know that it was Prime Minister who was able to overcome 
the resistance of the agricultural lobby, which in many ways had a veto power until then, preventing negotiations, really ambitious negotiations with large scale agricultural exporters. And uh, it, therefore, it was important to find um, a, a, a compromise. It was not just uh, all out reform. Some of the most important sensitive items for agriculture were not subject to liberalization, the so-called five sacred commodities. But nevertheless, Japan could join the big leagues of trade negotiations. And I think Japan has not looked back since. As you mentioned, uh, when the United States withdrew from the uh, original TPP, this was a huge setback uh, for Prime Minister Abe because TPP had importance not only in terms of lending credibility to its economic reform program, but also because of its foreign policy and the desire to um, work together with the United States, anchor the United States to the region in uh, light of a more powerful uh, China. And I think therefore it, it was a huge setback for Japan. Um, I remember that a lot of people said, this is dead, uh, the DPP will not move forward. Um, but I think it was a moment in time actually that I think you have described in some writers of your own and maybe for the paper for this uh, workshop we had earlier this year, there was, a, I think, a moment um, when things were very fluid. It could have gone either way. But I think that uh, the calculation was made that if you wanted to eventually go to a TPP-12 again with the United States on board, the agreement needed to survive. And uh, Japanese uh, leaders came to Washington. They also wanted to make sure that moving forward with the politicians came to Washington, that moving forward with the TPP would not alienate the United States. And I think that they felt reassured that it would not create uh, friction in the bilateral relationship. And Japan being the largest remaining uh, economy in the CPTPP was essential for this to work. And let me just add that they, uh, the remaining 11 countries, I think, took a very wise approach to the renegotiation. They decided to leave intact the tariff schedules because had they tried to rebalance the agreement that way, I think it could have become very unwieldy and the agreement might have floundered. And then what they did is that they uh, took a surgical approach, suspended some of the uh, TPP provisions, especially in the intellectual property chapter that mostly the Americans uh, cared about on questions, uh, issues like biologics, and that it made it much more palatable to the remaining 11 countries. And the calculus was right, that by making the TPP survive, that created pressure on the United States to reconsider. Now, the domestic politics of trade in this country are very, very complex, and I'm sure we can get into that. Um, but nevertheless, it did uh, work as it was supposed uh, to work. Um, in closing, uh, you know, uh, let me just uh, mention one of the shortcomings, um, because I want to um, you know, keep my, my initial intervention short. Um, I think that because we have come to expect so much of Japan as a champion of uh, trade liberalization, I think that for me, what was striking is that when COVID-19 uh, hit and we began to see very quickly the proliferation of export protectionism on medical supplies, on personal protective equipment, that uh, some countries began to articulate very forcefully that we should not resort to export protectionism. And I was hoping that Japan would be playing a more uh, of a leading role in that effort. And I think that Japan now is doing that, but it took a while. So that's one item. And the second one, again, picking up on Takenaka-san's focus on bilateral issues, the bilateral agreement with the United States is not stellar. It was pragmatically done. It was a, an exercise in damage control, but it's a very narrow market access agreement that because it did not cover automobiles or rice is not WTO consistent. So that I think is uh, um, a problematic from the point of view of Japan being a champion of high quality uh, trade agreements. But when your security guarantor comes knocking and cares only about trade deficits, that certainly puts you in a tight spot. Wonderful, thank you, Maria. That uh, those are great comments. So I'm gonna to turn to Masahiro now. Do you have the same uh, kind of list? Uh, yes. And if you, if you bring, uh, if you get to trade, it may be good to share your thoughts on why Japan did not join earlier this year, the MPIA, uh, you know, WTO, uh, the, the dispute settlement uh, mediation agreement with EU plus 15, uh, where Japan was expected because it was part of the Ottawa group. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, okay. Uh, on, uh, first of all, uh, I want to uh, 
I want to support uh, Takenaga-san's and, and Mireya's uh, po point of view. Uh, I think the biggest uh, contribution that uh, the Abe administration has done, uh, 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 did, was to fill the gap or void left by the United States when the U.S. Trump administration retreated from free trade, globalization, and multilateralism. So uh, TPP-11 uh, was an excellent uh, example for, for that. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, also, Japan uh, has been working with another big player, the European Union, uh, which uh, has been also championing uh, multilateralism. Uh, Japan and, and EU came up with uh, the Economic Partnership Agreement and also Strategic Partnership Agreement. Uh, they uh, uh, came up with a joint uh, statement on connectivity, sustainable connectivity and quality infrastructure uh, to respond to China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, uh, so, uh, so Japan uh, took uh, leadership uh, among uh, the TPP member countries and, and also worked with uh, the uh, EU. Um, FOIP, uh, I, I, I fully agree, FOIP is a very important uh, initiative and hopefully uh, this would uh, continue to be as significant as in the case of uh, uh, Abe administration under the Suga administration. Uh, Japan's contribution to the G20 process uh, was also quite uh, significant. Uh, the G20 principles for quality infrastructure investment and also uh, data free flow uh, with, uh, with trust uh, among, among others. Um, on the uh, issue uh, uh, Eve's uh, just, uh, just mentioned, uh, Japan clearly wants to see a functioning uh, WTO uh, to be restored. There's no question about that. But uh, Japan has had uh, some concerns uh, about the uh, WTO process towards uh, the uh, 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 dispute settlement process also, uh, uh, not to the extent of the United States, but uh, quite similar to the United States. The concerns were similar to the United States. So I think uh, Japan wants to see a kind of reformed uh, dispute settlement system uh, to be in place rather than just simply to restore the existing one, uh, I'm not sure how uh, the Suga administration is going to approach the WTO problem, but uh, uh, the U.S. concern about the dispute settlement uh, uh, issue uh, has been a long-standing issue, not not simply uh, the Trump administration's issue. So uh, there is a structural uh, problem with uh, the dispute settlement uh, system. So, so perhaps uh, uh, Japan uh, and, and the new US administration, Suga and, and Biden uh, may work on this uh, issue together. Uh, the shortcoming of uh, the Abe administration is what was the lack of uh, its uh, uh, policy towards climate change. Uh, the Ad Abe administration uh, was very reluctant to go very aggressively uh, forward uh, on climate uh, change issues. 
Uh, but uh, fortunately, under uh, Suga, uh, this has been reversed. So, so the new uh, Suga administration's uh, 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 view of uh, achieving uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 by achieving uh, uh, zero or greenhouse gas emission by 2050, I, I think uh, that's going to, uh, to kind of complement uh, or, or to negate the shortcoming of uh, the Abe administration. Uh, why don't I just stop here now? Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so now I'm turning to Saori. You, we can uh, wrap up all this. Do you, do you have the <laughs> yeah. same kind of list of, uh, and, and what are your thoughts? <laughs> I, well, so first of all, I thank Eve and everyone for inviting me. I, it's an honor to be part of this uh, member of the panelists. Um, I really enjoy uh, discussing everything with uh, all of you and thank you for the audience. So yes, I have basically the same list, but maybe put it in a kind of a more kind of a, a, a abstract or macro level. I think three achievement, one of which is for Abe is that he stayed in the office for a long time. I think it's been very important for a Japanese prime minister to be able to stay on the, in the office so that it can create network, personal connections and so on and so forth uh, related to uh, Japan's uh, foreign economic policy. And, you know, in, you know, in many ways, Japan, uh, the Abe managed his relationship with uh, both President Obama and President Trump quite effectively having in, you know, being in the office more than the American president, which is very rare. So I think that's one of the uh, main achievement. The second one is you know, definitely that you know, Prime Minister Abe managed to put Japan on the map. And you know, uh, Kawai Sensei already talked about G20, where you know, Japan made a lot of uh, you know, very important um, kind of uh, you know, agreement and, and principles and, and so on. And, and G7, which happened you know, uh, three years prior to that. So uh, all those really managed to put Japan on the map. And in addition, FOIP or you know, its coalition with uh, India or outreach to Africa, uh, many of these actions, and you know, Prime Minister Abe visited these places you know, much more than anybody, any prime ministers, uh, you know, Japan has ever had. So that kind of uh, activism to put Japan on the global map is really you know, another very important uh, achievement. And finally, you know, obviously everybody talked about the liberal international economic order, TPP, CP, uh, CPTPP, and, and, you know, EU, EPA. Also, RCEP is really, you know, even though the agreement came after Abe stepped down, but obviously all these negotiations happened uh, under his watch. And I think that should be considered as a really a major achievement. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, shortcomings, I think, you know, the loss of TPP. So yes, Japan saved TPP to make it CPTPP, but loss of TPP without, you know, so again, US being out of TPP actually had some impact domestically on Japan. I think you know, Abe, Abenomics third arrow was counting on TPP to really have this gaiatsu, the foreign pressure to change uh, a lot of these uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, old practices and then regulations and so on, where that, that was not as strongly uh, implemented. And then a lot of uh, critiques of Abenomics has uh, a lot of criticism about, you know, how Saud Aro was uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of didn't really, really, you know, make impact. So that's, that's definitely one part of it. Well, I, I would say, you know, when it comes to bilateral relations, I think the relationship with South Korea, especially in the kind of more recent, you know, last couple of years has been uh, very difficult. So I'll stop here. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So we're going to follow up with one more point on Abe before we turn to Suga. Uh, and it's to zero down a little bit on the relation with China. Uh, you know, Prime Minister Abe has been very well known from his very first term on for his focus on deterrence against uh, the rise of China, the threat of, of China. Uh, he, he came up with the idea of the Quad back in 2007. He went to India, uh, very strong on security side, military side, very strong voice uh, on, when he came to island dispute, uh, you know, Senkaku Diaoyu, uh, et cetera. So that's the well-known side, the building up the security alliance with the US. Uh, and yet, at the same time, we, uh, over the last two, three years, we have had remarkable stability in the, at least economic and geopolitical relation with China. 
uh, to the point that when Abe stepped down, uh, the spokesperson of the Chinese foreign ministry praised Abe for good contribution to the bilateral relationship and all kind of success with the G20 and the like. So what explains the paradox? You know, what, how did we get to this? Uh, nobody expected in that sense this to happen. And in 2020, when everything is so chaotic on the COVID, well, the Japan-China relation has been re you know, remarkably stable, except for the disputed islands, right, where there's frustration. But uh, I mean, it's more stability than we could expect. Uh, so maybe I'll turn first to, uh, uh, to Kawai-sensei and then uh, <laughs> take different orders. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, uh, Japan uh, uh, tried to restore uh, uh, economic and political relationship with uh, China uh, in 2017. Uh, uh, Japan, uh, Mr. Abe sent uh, its uh, delegation to the first forum on international uh, cooperation uh, for the Belt and Road Initiative uh, in Beijing. Uh, and then immediately after that, uh, Mr. Abe has said, that he would support the BRI uh, uh, with some conditions like openness, transparency, debt sustainability, and so forth. And then uh, the two countries started to talk about uh, joint uh, uh, projects in third countries uh, with, uh, with conditions, uh, openness, transparency, economic feasibility, debt sustainability. So, uh, so, so that was uh, the turning point. And in 2018, uh, Lika Chan visited uh, Japan and uh, Prime Minister Abe visited uh, China. Uh, so I, I think uh, the motivation was uh, economics. Uh, economic uh, relationship was considered to be very important. And there were many uh, Japanese companies interested in joining uh, BRI projects but they did not know how, and uh, they wanted uh, the Japanese government to clarify uh, its position. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, Mr. Abe had the motivation to restore a good uh, political uh, relationship. So, so it was not a surprise for the two countries to get closer. Uh, after all, economic interdependence is very strong between the two countries. Many Japanese companies are doing business in China. Uh, and uh, during uh, this COVID-19 uh, period, uh, Japan has been importing a lot of uh, uh, medical, medical you know, supplies, uh, 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 PCs, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for uh, 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 remote, uh, uh, remote uh, uh, work. Um, however, uh, the two countries, uh, uh, in particular Japanese perceptions towards China have not improved. According to the most recent uh, uh, opinion survey reported by Genron NPO, Japanese perception towards China uh, is getting worse. Uh, and uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, view towards uh, China uh, 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 is reversing. Uh, uh, even though Chinese perception towards Japan has been improving. So, so still from uh, the Japanese perspective, there are many things that uh, China needs to do to convince Japan that uh, China is a very viable partner uh, good partner to to work with, but after all, uh, economics uh, has has made a turn around. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Masahiro. So maybe I'll turn to Saori. Saori San, what do you think <laughs> about this China question? Mm -hmm. So you know, Japan has been working with China. You know, kind of working with this very um, difficult relationship with China for a long time, and you know, J Japan is. China's neighbor, its interdependence is very high as Kawai Sensei has already mentioned. So I think it's natural that it kind of swings you no know, different ways, but obviously the election of President Trump and the way that you know, Trump has dealt with China really affected 
China, no, not only Japan's、uh, relationship with China, but the other way around, the China's relationship or perception or strategy toward Japan. So I think the、uh, overall、uh, rapprochement with、uh, China and Japan, in some ways, of tw- no, 2017 is, you know, is partly triggered by the U.S. position towards China and how Japan,、uh, China reacted to it, and how Japan responded to that. But more generally, I would like to argue that、uh, in many ways, Japan, what Japan is pushing, this liberal international economic order, is actually good for China too. You know, obviously, China wants to kind of tackle some of these unfairness, according to their perspective, or maybe you know, pushing their way of、uh, economic development through maybe state-owned enterprises and so on and so forth. But at the same time, you know, they are now becoming more advanced、uh, in terms of their production, technology, and so on and so forth. They are the big creditors in the world. They would like to kind of have some protection of their, you know, kind of credit creditor status.、Uh, maybe even in the future, in the intellectual property rights, if they are the producer. Of the cutting edge technology, so altogether now China's kind of looking at let's say RCEP even even though it's not as high standard as it is you know as CPTPP or TPP while you know many of the kind of protection investment protection and so on in place so in in some ways maybe that's kind of a, a you know wishful thinking maybe but it's a realization on the part of China that this order could be. Beneficial to them, and they are now working, you know, to in some cases working with Japan to、uh, set this、uh, regional order, economic order, in place. Can I uh, j- uh, just just make a very brief、uh, comment? I fully support with uh, uh, Saori. Uh, uh, Japan's、uh, contribution is to convince China uh, to uh, to adopt. International standards, international rules. Uh, in uh, 19, uh, sorry, in 2019, in the second、uh, international forum on the BRI,、uh, President Xi Jinping made a statement to the effect that、uh, the country China would respect、uh, openness, transparency,、uh, debt sustainability, and so forth for the BRI. And uh, uh, he uh, made a statement that、uh, the BRI should be a, a、uh, high quality, high quality project,、uh, and and that eventually led to his acceptance of the G20 principles uh, uh, for uh, uh, quality infrastructure investment. So, so at least、uh, he said that, and at least China expressed its intention to pursue. High-quality BRI. Perhaps、uh, Japan has been successful in convincing China to say that.、Uh, although you know we have yet to see if、uh, the BRI would really become high quality and that sustainability issue would be respected. Uh, uh, still, uh, China uh, made uh, made a commitment,、uh, which is、uh, which is good. Great. Thank. Thank you. So Harukata-san, what's your view on this China-Japan paradox under Abe? <laughs> well, I think Prime Minister Abe was very—he's a realist—and、um, Japan made a very pragmatic、uh, response to China. And、um, it is allegedly said that Secretary General、uh, Nikai-san said that we have to confront with China, anyways. But there is no need to. Have open confrontation with China. Okay, that's what he said. So we we、um, if BRI contributes to development of other countries, there's nothing Japan goes against. And also, there's other strategic reasons. We do we we want to. I mean, I think Japan wants to make、um, wants to、um, wants to make、uh, China not oppose、uh, FOIP. And、uh, so the G- Japanese government has been saying that、uh, we welcome Japan welcomes China's participation in FOIP. We can do some joint project in FOIP. So I think this reflects economic reality that, as uh, as uh, Saori-san and、um, Masahiro-san has have just said, 
uh, we have so much interdependence between China and uh, Japan. And I think economically speaking, the two economies are inseparable. So I think we have to um, have a good relationship uh, with China on economic front. So I think that this reality uh, was reflected in Prime Minister Abe's response to uh, China. Yeah, that's my take. Excellent, very wise. And so Mireya, you get to conclude this. <laughs> yes, uh, well, everybody has made a uh, very good point. So not much left for me to say, but let me just add a few um, thoughts. Um, I mean, clearly uh, the Japan-China relationship has moved towards, uh, it has stabilized over the last few years with an assumption of high level uh, political uh, dialogue. And, uh, you know, it really uh, um, was based on the desire from both parties to achieve that outcome. And I do think that the deterioration of uh, U.S.-China relations provided China with a very strong incentive to be more pragmatic in uh, its relationship uh, with Japan. Um, I think that what we've been seeing in the area of infrastructure investment, as everybody has uh, mentioned, is that you uh, have uh, constructive competition, if you will because Japan and China are the countries that are providing the bulk of the financing for these projects that are trying to close an infrastructure gap. And uh, to the extent that China wants to aspire to the um, quality infrastructure standards of the, uh, of the Japanese, I think that from the point of view of Japanese diplomacy, that is a success. Um, but I would also, um, uh, and I think it's a positive message for Southeast Asia that, you know, uh, Japan and China are not embarking on zero sum competition and that you can uh, work with both. But I also would like to emphasize perhaps a little more than what has been emphasized so far, that there are nevertheless very strong competitive dynamics between these two countries. And during the rapprochement, China did not uh, ease on its pressure in the Senkaku Dayu Islands. And we just saw this um, uh, uncomfortable moment uh, a few days ago with the visit of the foreign uh, minister of uh, China to Japan, Wang Yi, when he referred in the press conference right next to Foreign Minister Motegi to uh, this issue. So that territorial question remains very much front and center in, um, and I think it's going to be, uh, it will determine how far this rapprochement or this warming of relations can go. But in addition to that, I think it's important to uh, note that uh, Japan has recently been emphasizing more what we refer to as economic security. So a number of defensive economic measures, such as tightening the screaming of foreign direct investment uh, projects, uh, cybersecurity uh, laws, um, and uh, 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 the onshoring subsidies or the restructuring of supply chain subsidies to be more precise, because it's not just about bringing some production back to Japan, but also uh, uh, shifting it to Southeast Asia to diminish uh, over-dependence uh, on China and some uh, key products. So that is all happening. So in my mind, what Japan can teach perhaps the United States and others is that you can uh, um, undertake what I call selective competition. So instead of embarking on all out uh, 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 competition on all fronts, it's important to pick up your battles and it's important to uh, um, have measures where you perceive risks, but also not give up on the benefits of economic interdependence. Brilliant. Uh, I'm going to uh, jump right away here to the question of RCEP. So, uh, and I'll start with you, Maria, um, uh, while you catch your breath. So, you know, it's pretty striking. 2020, there is a worldwide uh, COVID outbreak pandemic. There is you know, a, a huge economic shock, the biggest since the Great Depression. That's what the IMF has said. Uh, lots of tensions everywhere. Uh, you know, lots of protectionist measures, lots of onshoring, supply chains in question. I mean, that's the debate, especially in the US, right? But globally. And in the midst of this, lo and behold, uh, you know, 15 countries representing 30% of population and GDP of the world uh, sign RCEP, the, the biggest free trade ever uh, agreement of any country. Uh, so the, the the optics of a phenomenal, right? In the midst of everything else. So what's the, you know, is it just optics or is it going to have momentum? Does it create momentum for more uh, regional integration? Does it mean more regional integration? And, and that means including China, I guess there's no decoupling from China if you have RCEP. 
Uh, and Japan clearly was the pivotal player, right? It wouldn't happen without Japan, even though it's ASEAN-led, but Japan is the pivot in this. So what was Japan thinking, right? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Eve. I mean, I think it definitely goes beyond optics. And I think that the timing of this agreement is very important because we are uh, going through a moment of increasing protectionism. Uh, even before COVID, we had already China and the United States embarking in a heated uh, tariff war and uh, we had all kinds of other forms of protectionism proliferating. And then of course with COVID, uh, the, the um, tendencies only increase. So I think it's very encouraging to see 15 uh, countries in this region uh, make a bet on rules-based uh, economic integration. And given that you know, you're talking about 30% of world GDP, it matters. Um, I also think that what's most significant about RCEP is that it's going to um, nurture uh, global supply chains. Global supply chains that are increasingly um, under scrutiny. We, uh, I mentioned uh, a while ago the reshoring subsidies that some countries are considering. So to the extent that you have lenient rules of origin that allow companies in these 15 countries to meet the criteria to benefit from the tariff preferences easily, that's going to encourage uh, further cross-border investment, further cross-border um, uh, trade activities. And I think that's all very uh, positive. Um, also very positive, uh, Saori alluded to the very complex relationship between Japan and South Korea. Well, this marks the first time that these two countries as part of this larger grouping are going to be trading on preferential uh, terms. Uh, for Japan, I think that the biggest loss along the way was the exit of India. And Japan had been very adamant and very interested in having India uh, stay on as, you know, as, a, as, as a fellow democracy, as a very large market in trying to also promote some liberalization. For India, the bar proved uh, too high. Um, and they were uh, primarily concerned with the trade uh, balance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China. Now, RCEP, I, uh, I don't think the right way to think about it is necessarily to compare it to CPTPP because they're very different uh, um, exercises in terms of the scope of the rules. There's not going to be anything on state-owned enterprises. Uh, the um, provisions, and I haven't read the entirety of the agreement because it's very long, but the provisions on data flows, there as the possibility to invoke uh, national security exemptions to get uh, to not really abide by them. So uh, it's not going to be as ambitious as TPP on the uh, rules part of it, but nevertheless, it is uh, um, a very substantial agreement that could in, over time evolve and uh, produce even further uh, liberalization. And my last point Eve, is that what this really uh, brings, hammers the point is that the United States is looking from the outside in. You have now two large mega trade agreements in the region. And even though the United States could not really or would not necessarily be interested in RCEP because uh, of the standards issue that I just mentioned, nevertheless, the fact is that intra-regional integration is proceeding and it has foreign policy considerations and the United States has not yet found the way to have a very compelling uh, uh, a strategy of economic engagement with the region. And it's very important, I think, for the Biden administration to uh, uh, devise a strategy to do so. Um, Saudi, what do you think about our set? <laughs> I have nothing to add. <laughs> Mire, Mire <laughs> is to be short. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I do feel that no, this is the, the this is what Japan wanted uh, way back, you know, almost 15 years ago. And you know, even though you know everybody kind of tend to say that the RCEP is China led, it's not. It's ASEAN-led and Japan's the major player in it. But at the same time, I think the US-China uh, trade war really made China more and more interested in RCEP, one. And two, I think the COVID kind of pushed was a tailwind too, in the sense that, you know, kind of uh, other countries kind of thinking about other the alternative supply chains, uh, you know, kind of worried too much, worried about too much dependence on, on China's production, kind of pushed China to really see this is really important uh, kind of component. And, you know, uh, and also again, kind of uh, achievement on the part of Japan is that having CPTPP come into effect and, and you know, Japan EU uh, prior to this, really uh, provided a, a good 
leverage on the part of Japanese government to negotiate this uh, effectively. Obviously, the rules are much, you know, kind of shallower, and also the the tariff liberalization uh, liberalization kind of period is much longer. But altogether, I think it's a great achievement, you know, for Japanese companies to the access to the Chinese market in terms of out parts or batteries, and you know, many of them. Uh, would have, you know, kind of would be uh, able to go without tariff, uh, you know, pretty pretty soon. So it's a, it's overall a very great achievement, and it put pressure on the U.S. Uh, Harukata-san, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Just um. Well, I have nothing. Well, it's very hard to add something to uh, to specialists. So I just made this uh, Suga-san following the lead of Teddy Roosevelt. And um, hold on. So this is what Japan has been doing. I mean, like so much concern about China's influence in RCEP. So just I want to say that Japan has been following the lead of Teddy uh, Roosevelt, he said, speak softly and carry a big stick, you will go far. I mean, this is a statement he made in Minneapolis in 1901. And um, so, I mean, this is what Suga-san has, has done. Like soft talks, I mean, RCEP is a part of soft talks, I think. But it is supported by sticks. So if we look at the chronology, you now we have been strengthening this uh, Quad. I mean, the relationship between the United States, Australia, and India. And I think we are seeing the rise of uh, quadruple entente. I mean, it can never be an alliance given the strategic neutrality which in the India uh, uh, sticks. Uh, and uh, we also had a Suga Biden tele summit on November 12th, which confirmed that U United US Japan Security Treaty applied to Senkaku Islands. And we also had a Japan-Australia summit on November 17th, and the Prime Minister uh, of Australia uh, came all, took the pain of uh, spending two weeks after his visit to Japan to confirm and strengthen security relationship between uh, uh, Japan and Australia. So, I mean, um, so this kind of, I mean, this, this also expands to uh, the, the topic we just covered as regards to uh, Japan-China relationship. Since uh, we are, since economic relationship with China is so important, we don't want to undermine that kind of relationship and we are supporting and we are kind of uh, have insurance um, by uh, strengthening security ties with other countries in the Pacific, and that so, and that applies to our uh, this uh, conclusion of RCEP uh, as well. I think that's my take of what's happening here. Thank you. Fascinating, very strategic view. Uh, and uh, um, Masahiro, Matayasan, are you here? So you get to conclude okay, yeah, the RCEP yes, yes. view here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, RCEP is a very important uh, trade agreement for Japan. Uh, uh, in the US, uh, looks like uh, there is a view that uh, it's uh, led by China, uh, as pointed out by Saudi, uh, and, and dominated by China. It may be dominated by China, but uh, clearly uh, it has not been led by China alone. Uh, uh, Japan has been a very strong supporter of ASEAN plus six FTA, uh, while China uh, uh, supported ASEAN plus three FTA. And eventually uh, ASEAN came up with uh, 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 RCEP, which is uh, uh, ASEAN plus six agreement. Uh, so so it's, uh, it's not uh, correct, right, to say that uh, it has been led by China. And uh, for Japan, uh, uh, there are some uh, significant uh, features. One is that uh, uh, for the first time, Japan has a de facto FTA with China and also with Korea through RCEP, uh, which, is a, uh, uh, which is a very, very important. Japan now has market access 
uh, to greater market access to uh, China. Uh, second, uh, it has uh, trade and investment rules uh, uh, like uh, you know uh, prohibiting uh, forced technology transfer uh, with regard to investment. Uh, with regard to e-commerce, uh, 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 a uh, uh, you know some specific uh, server, uh, uh, you know the requirement of uh, setting up uh, uh, fundamental server in the country uh, uh, should not be should not be required. I mean, you know, uh, so China's position uh, uh, so far has been compromised. Uh, and uh, intellectual property part, uh, there are many uh, supporting uh, provisions uh, to protect uh, trademarks and, and, and so forth. Uh, and thirdly, uh, Australia and New Zealand, although they may not uh, really require RCEP, uh, uh, but uh, they are there, uh, perhaps for uh, geopolitical reasons, uh, which, is, uh, which is a very uh, important, uh, important part. Uh, so overall, uh, RCEP is, uh, is quite important. And once it's implemented, perhaps just like CPTPP, the next agenda is to expand uh, RCEP membership uh, to include of course, India and other Indo-Pacific countries uh, in the region. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and perhaps uh, uh, another uh, thing we have to think about uh, uh, from now on is uh, China, uh, China's interest in CPTPP. Uh, if uh, there are some, uh, you know, uh, interesting questions uh, we may we may uh, address uh, this issue thank you excellent uh, great so I see time is uh, coming quickly so we'll do one last question and take all these great questions coming up uh, and so we need to turn to Suga and to the US election and we'll bundle this and I'll ask each of you uh, so since September, we have a new Japanese prime minister with new priorities. We heard about climate from Masahiro san and then now we have a new incoming uh, U.S. administration. So what are the, the, you know, the two things that you see as most important uh, changing elements uh, with both new leaders, uh, you know, either coming from Japan or coming from the U.S. or coming from the interactions? Uh, what do you see happening? What do you forecast uh, you know, coming this year? Uh, maybe you start with Saudi this time? Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, hopefully, you know, from the Japanese side, I think uh, Prime Minister Suga is set to follow basically the uh, Prime Minister Abe's footsteps moving forward, even though there are a few kind of domestic, really kind of party politics going on, it seems like, so I don't know what the future holds. Uh, but it's important really to keep Japan's position uh, in the liberal international order uh, in place really intact. At the same time, I think the hope is that U.S. will come back and, and the Biden will come back to the multilateral tables uh, and you know, both regional and global so that uh, the kind of push towards this uh, kind of maintaining this order will not only fall on the Japanese shoulders. You know, at the same time, there are some whispers in the LDP corridors maybe that, uh, you know, Trump's kind of approach to China was beneficial for Japan, but hopefully, uh, you know, kind of multilateral engagement will constrain you know, China well enough that Japan can maneuver, you know, kind of, kind of uh, its relationship with China in, in this good relationship with China uh, moving forward. Great. So Harukata-san, what do you think? Both what does the Suga administration change and what does the Biden incoming administration change? Mm -hmm. Well, I think Suga, Suga, Suga-san will probably uh, follow through. I mean, just Sauri san has said, uh, Abe, Abe's external policy, and uh, he will continue to uh, formulate various policies under the banner of uh, FOIP. And uh, we welcome, I mean, we expect the United States will be back in Indo, 
in the Pacific or in Asia. And uh, President Trump endorsed uh, the B- FOIP in 2017 in Hanoi, but nothing substantive came up under Trump administration, and he did not, and I mean, we all know this, he did not participate in East Asia summit and, uh, and so forth. So Biden, uh, I hope President Biden will come up with more concrete policies to, um, to, uh, to under uh, FOIP, although he may not use this terminology free, free and open, he might say something like prosperous and uh, peaceful in the Pacific or something, but uh, the real, the, the gist or the, the essence of the, pol- I mean, the Pacific region would not, would not, would not, I hope it will not change and the United States and Japan can cooperate more uh, in the region and especially in engaging India. Uh, to the economic and security relationships uh, with uh, Japan and United States. And that's, that's my hope. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, Masahiro-san, what do you think? Yes, uh, uh, I, I have a very strong feeling that uh, the Biden uh, administration and Suga administration uh, would work uh, very strongly uh, uh, in a very cooperative way. Uh, 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 the uh, you know the kind of threat that uh, Trump uh, has exercised on uh, Japan, like uh, threatening to increase tariffs on auto imports, uh, and uh, 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 the uh, uh, Japan-U.S. Uh, security uh, arrangement uh, uh, has been uh, you know a little bit uh, shaken. Uh, uh, I don't think uh, that's uh, the kind of thing that uh, we expect uh, from now on. Uh, The uh, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, which was Trump's strategy, uh, uh, hopefully uh, the new administration would uh, inherit that uh, that, uh, strategy uh, the uh, uh, hopefully uh, the new administration would focus more on economic economic aspects of the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, strategy uh, uh, to uh, 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 provide uh, more economic incentives for Indo-Pacific countries to to join, uh, other than uh, uh, Australia. Uh, Japan and uh, uh, India. Uh, and also on climate uh, change issues, uh, uh, the two countries uh, can work together uh, very closely. And uh, we expect uh, the, Trump, uh, the Biden administration to be very aggressive on uh, climate. And uh, the US would become uh, once again the leader uh, in this uh, area, and, and Japan can clearly uh, work uh, together. Uh, and, and also the Biden administration's intention to work with uh, allies and like-minded countries to consolidate the pressure on China uh, uh, so that the China uh, would, uh, uh, would be pressured to change. Uh, uh, on its domestic uh, economic uh, policy and hopefully uh, the political uh, direction. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty about uh, this and also China's uh, uh, behavior in the South China Sea. Uh, this is uh, uh, another important issue. Uh, one of the concerns for uh, Japan is that uh, by uh, identifying uh, co- cooperation areas with China, like uh, climate change, uh, uh, the U.S. may soften its uh, pressure uh, on China uh, with regard to its behavior in South China Sea. So, so hopefully uh, that's not going to happen. And, uh, and uh, the Biden administration, hopefully, would continue uh, to be very uh, uh, strong and vocal 
against uh, China's uh, behavior in the South China Sea, while at the same time seeking uh, uh, economic, uh, uh, economic uh, cooperation and other types of cooperation. Uh, the most important thing is for Japan and China together uh, to work hard to put pressure on China so that China would change. Big agenda. And Mireya, what do you think? <laughs> well, I think this is a very interesting time because we're going to have a power transition in the United States and Japan just a few months apart. So that gives, a, it's a new beginning. And I think a lot of opportunities come uh, from that. At a very mundane level, but I don't think it's insignificant. Um, I think that if uh, the election in the United States had gone in a different way and it was a re-election of President Trump, I think that that would actually put a pressure on Suga to try to recreate the Abe magic, if you will. And he would always be compared as to whether he could indeed uh, work with this very unconventional American president. So I think that for Suga, it might be easier to be dealing with a clean slate and to deal with someone like President-elect Biden, who's also a very seasoned um, uh, politician. Uh, he has a lot of experience in policy uh, making, and in that sense, that's a shared trait uh, between the two uh, leaders. So that's one uh, point. I also think that it will be um, a, a United States that is easier to recognize for uh, countries uh, in Asia in the sense that, as many others were saying, there's going to be a return to international organizations, a return to multilateralism. Uh, I think that what Trump had been, President Trump has been practicing is like a withdrawal doctrine, doctrine right? Uh, we don't like it. We leave the WHO, we leave the Iran deal, we leave Paris. Um, so a return to of the United States to those forums will be welcomed by uh, Japan and others. I also think that the United States may have, with this uh, new administration, a more productive, uh, constructive approach to WTO reform. I don't think that there is a desire to sabotage it. The discontent with the dispute settlement mechanism precedes Trump, uh, and therefore those concerns would need to be addressed. But I'm hoping that the United States would move beyond just saying uh, what we've been hearing the past four years that we're not happy with the way things are working without offering a blueprint for reform. And hopefully there can be a more concrete set of proposals that would satisfy the US concerns with the dispute settlement uh, mechanism. On the bilateral agenda, I think it would be important to watch what happens with the burden uh, sharing negotiations, those nation support. The Trump administration has uh, been operating with very inflated uh, demands, both vis a vis South Korea and uh, Japan. So it would be interesting to see if the Biden administration takes a more um, moderate approach on those uh, negotiations. Um, then uh, on the uh, Indo Pacific, um, I think that uh, it's interesting that in the first phone call between uh, Prime Minister Suga and President-elect Biden, uh, that already came up and there's been a lot of discussion, especially in Japanese circles about the choice of adjectives, whether instead of free and open, it was secure and prosperous, does that indicate a shift in policy? My position on that is that I think that there is a wide uh, uh, spread understanding in the United States of the strategic significance of the region I think that there's no desire to change Indo-PACOM, for example. I think uh, that is the prism through which uh, uh, the United States, regardless of the administration, is going to look at this region. It's the broader uh, geographical uh, uh, area, including uh, India and so forth. Um, and, you know, every administration wants to have its own spin. I see that more as nomenclature, but I don't see that as um, a shift in direction. I know that because some of the faces in the Biden administration are familiar from the Obama year, some people might think that this is an Obama 2.0 foreign policy. I think that the world has changed quite a bit in this past few years. I think that the bipartisan consensus in the United States has toughened vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, China. Hopefully there's a way to find areas for uh, uh, pragmatic cooperation with uh, China. That doesn't mean that the United States is not going to, again, more assertive in the areas where it considers that its national interests are at stake. So it's that ability to differentiate by issue area, and in particular to coordinate uh, with allies that I think is going to distinguish the Biden administration compared uh, to the Trump administration. And last but not least, 
Um, and this is a real concern, I think, is that, you know, the United States really is going through a very difficult uh, period. We, we are not doing well with the pandemic, polarization, partisanship, hyper-partisanship, tears to the social fabric are very apparent. And I think that the concern is that we might be inward uh, looking. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's plenty of domestic issues that this administration needs to um, uh, be tackling. The economic crisis, the economic hardship is very real. But obviously, Asia is not waiting. And therefore, I think that what we need to do here is to think about an economic engagement agenda that can survive fractious domestic politics and domestic priorities taking the bulk of our attention and nevertheless make the United States a useful partner, a consequential actor in the region. And I think there are a number of things that could be done on that front. Uh, for example, negotiations on the digital uh, domain to have a broader plurilateral agreement, um, 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 something along the lines of supply chain resilience, and I'm hoping strongly with an emphasis of keeping open medical uh, supply chains, uh, dialogues on economic security to try to avoid hyper-defensive economic measures that could hamper investment flows or innovation and therefore disseminate uh, best uh, practices. And then eventually we do need to talk about a return to uh, the mega trade agreements and how that could uh, happen. But I think that in the meantime, we reassure our partners. We could also do uh, something as, uh, you know, um, be more disciplined in the imposition of national security tariffs, reform the process so that it's not just the purview of the executive, but Congress has a say to try to rein in uh, those abuses of uh, that discipline. And there are other things that we could do to persuade others that we're going to be constructive in the region going forward. Well, that was a tour de force. Thank you, Maria. So we got lots of questions. Uh, we'll try to be quick and take quite a few uh, one by one. So there is two questions uh, from uh, uh, both Kristen and one more person about uh, uh, the likelihood of U.S. joining CPTPP uh, and whether Japan and others will be willing to modify it uh, to make it easier for the U.S. Uh, and then as well, how about uh, the U.K.? Uh, and then how about even China? Because we had this amazing moment where Xi Jinping personally saying, I'm interested in CPTPP. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, well, the U.S. is not yet, but uh, so... All right, so we'll, we'll have two people. Anyone has a strong desire to jump on this one? Yeah, okay, Maria, yeah, first, and then one more person after. And yeah. I'm sorry, has been looking at China and CPTPP, so I'll drag her into uh, <laughs> this as well. <laughs> okay, well, you'll let, be me, next. let me start with the yeah. uh, US uh, part of this. Um, you know, uh, it, the message has been very clear from the incoming Biden administration that it's not how they're going to start. That's not in the first hundred days. That might not even be in the uh, first year. Uh, but I do think that um, there's going to be a lot of uh, pressure from the region for the United States to reconsider and that a lot of people here in the United States also feel the costs of exclusion, both in economic terms, both in uh, geopolitical uh, terms. Um, I think there's a, a way back uh, for the United States, clearly it's towards the CPTPP because that's the agreement that is in force. The other TPP was not ratified uh, by the other remaining countries except I think uh, uh, by Japan and maybe uh, another, I don't remember at this moment, but it's the CPTPP that's, that's the ball game. And that's the one that the United States should try to return. And actually that's good news because um, some of the uh, provisions that the, United, that the CPTPP countries decided to suspend, to freeze, are in the intellectual property chapter, as I said before. And therefore, there is greater alignment between the, say, the US-Mexico-Canada trade agreement and the CPTPP. Um, and uh, I bring the US-Mexico-Canada trade agreement because that's the one agreement that has been approved in a bipartisan way. And those kinds of votes don't happen in Congress very frequently anymore. So I think that that's a template that we have to look at. I think that this would mean that the United States is going to ask for some changes to the CPTPP. I don't think that they would just um, say, uh, show me the line and I'll sign. Uh, and it needs to be sold domestically too. And I imagine that therefore they would ask for tighter uh, labor provisions and climate uh, provisions. So a targeted, uh, um, 
negotiation is the way forward. I don't see much luck in starting from scratch with a large scale trade agreement because who's going to believe the United States that they'll deliver at the end of the line? Um, I also think that for the existing CPTPP countries, there is less risk in entertaining the United States in an accession bid because if the US domestic politics get messy again, there's no risk because the CPTPP continues to move forward as opposed to what happened with the original TPP when there was a real moment of peril that the entire enterprise could have uh, floundered. Um, now the question is, are the CPTP countries willing to undertake and accept those targeted revisions for the benefit of bringing a large market of the, of the United States and bringing a major uh, uh, a security uh, partner for uh, many of them? And I think that's the calculus that needs to be made. Okay. Great. Uh, so, Kawaii-sensei, Masahiro-san. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes, uh, as uh, uh, Mireya said, uh, uh, the U.S., uh, the new administration initially may not uh, be able to discuss uh, the issue, but uh, many countries in the region uh, would uh, raise uh, their voice uh, for the U.S. to return to TPP. And uh, although Japan may not want to renegotiate, but uh, if uh, necessary, I'm sure Japan is willing to, to renegotiate. And renegotiation is much better. Renegotiated return of uh, the US to TPP is much better than US absence uh, in uh, TPP. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm sure uh, countries uh, 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 which uh, uh, implemented uh, CPTPP would be ready to renegotiate. Um, now, uh, on the uh, China, on the uh, China's uh, uh, accession to CPTPP, I think uh, it's uh, it's really good. Uh, uh, for China to uh, uh, express uh, that uh, that interest, I think uh, 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 we should not uh, uh, turn China away uh, from this uh, uh, interest. Uh, uh, however, uh, how uh, how uh, should we accommodate uh, China's interest? I think we have a framework to do that. That's uh, China-Japan-Korea FTA negotiation. Uh, Japan should be putting uh, TPP provisions uh, uh, to China and, and uh, should uh, argue that uh, China should be ready to uh, uh, accept these provisions uh, in the CJK FTA negotiation. Um, as long as uh, negotiations uh, can continue, uh, I think uh, uh, it's good to see if China is really serious in uh, uh, reforming uh, SOEs, uh, which China uh, is not interested in now, but uh, over a longer term perspective, uh, we can uh, see if China uh, is willing to move towards the direction of TPP. The framework of that is uh, CJK FDA negotiation. And once the US comes back to TPP, uh, China uh, uh, needs to face the US for a more serious negotiation uh, to join TPP. Well, yeah, Can oh, I yeah. just chip in yeah. one, one quickly yeah. about China? So um, my course, uh, Alex Lin and I have published uh, one piece and we are working another one about China's interest in TPP and CPTPP. And you know, in some ways, uh, actually the Chinese reformist leaders would like to use that as a, a gaiatsu in a kind of same way that Japan had wanted to use TPP as gaiatsu to reform China. So, uh, and, but, but even, even with that, uh, so they've been talking a, a, a lot favorably about TPP in the past from 2013 to 2016. While uh, this is the first time actually Xi Jinping himself actually publicly said 
that China has an interest in uh, joining CPTPP. So that's that to me is a signaling towards the rest of the world that China is quite serious about uh, this type of agreement. And you know, we will see how much of the you know that will come in reality. But I think it's a, a very interesting step forward. Yeah, that just could I just um, make one yeah. point? Yeah, and I'll, I'll add one more point on this so you can incorporate that. There is another question from Shige-san that said, by the way, TPP was also about security. You know, Abe-san yeah. said the, the security value of TPP is enormous to hedge against China. So in current discussion, where is that security concern? Is it gone or? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, the thing I wanted to say mm -hmm. was, you know, the I think the the most likely uh, next join, joiner, I mean, the, the next candidate is probably the British. And I think it's very important to have them because they also champion uh, free and uh, free trade. And, uh, and I think that will increase the Japanese and uh, OG's leverage over China. So I think that the security is, well, it means that I know it was... Um, uh, well, I think Kawai Sensei and others are more more familiar with this, but I think it was it aimed at um, um, shifting Japanese supply chains to other countries, and that's still working. But uh, maybe the security calculations might change if China really joins. But I think we have to uh, have to have China accept the current standards. And to have them accept our standards in current TPP, they might ask for renegotiations or something, you know, because they might use their market as a leverage for other countries to change some standards. But that's that. I think that's why important. I mean, it's important. It it would be a drive, uh, It would be nice if the, we can have the United States first. But since it's unlikely, we are expecting the British to play an important role. Uh, if, can I jump yeah. or do you need to move to another question? Uh, yeah, you can have uh, 30 seconds and then we'll... Sure. I, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit skeptical about the chance of China joining uh, CPTPP <laughs> <laughs> anytime soon. I think it, it makes for a great rhetorical uh, uh, point. But when you look at uh, many of the tools or strategies, economic policies of China, they're not pointing towards the higher standards of the TPP, but doubling down on industrial subsidies and uh, a very predominant, uh, uh, prominent role for state-owned enterprises. Um, I think that uh, the best scenario for China to join would be along the lines of what Kawai-san um, presented. And I thought that was a very interesting idea that, you know, you have that uh, trilateral negotiation to ensure that China is ready for the for the high quality standards, because another way in which this could, could happen is that China tries to water down the, the, the uh, disciplines of the CPTPP through negotiating side letters that have exemptions of, you know, where the disciplines would apply on China. And that I think would be a real problem because then you actually would um, uh, lower the quality of the agreement. I don't think that there's a lot of uh, interest for that. And let's not forget the politics of the moment. And uh, you have to have the agreement of all countries. And given where our relations between Australia, for example, and China right now, um, I just don't see that happening anytime soon. Mm. All right. So there's then two hot potato issues. Maybe I'll start with Harukata on those. Uh, Taiwan and North Korea. So Alston is asking... Uh, how uh, Japan treads the line between China and Taiwan with Abe having called uh, Taiwan an extremely important partner uh, mm -hmm. and how in you know, this very sensitive line. And then John is asking uh, whether North Korea and the abductees are still an issue in Japanese politics and if we can uh, expect anything there, if Japan a player at all. <laughs> well, let me, let, me start, let me start answering this North Korean question. I mean, it's, it's domestically, I mean, there's no choice for any administrations to set that off the political agenda. And Suga-san is personally committed to this issue. So I think we are going to seek, I mean, we are going to seek the return of the other, uh, the, uh, uh, the, those people who were taken away by North Korea. Although, you know, we cannot expect a short-term result, short-term result. And as regards to Taiwan, well, this is sensitive. I think um, 
Yeah, we have just sent prime, uh, former Prime Minister Mori uh, for the funeral. Uh, that's something important. And I think this is really a function of United States-Taiwan relationship. I think it's, it's been improving or uh, it's, uh, I mean, the political significance of uh, United States-Taiwan relationship has become, I think the, the large, it be becoming growing, uh, growing larger and larger. And so maybe we might more uh, attach more importance to Taiwan, but that's politically very difficult uh, because uh, given the economic importance of China. But I think we 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 we, we probably ha have like Taiwan card uh, in our hands uh, to to kind of a bargaining chip with a big China. But I don't think we are really going to use it. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, Hiroki San is asking about uh, Suga's nuclear policy uh, as part of the vision for climate change. So maybe since Masahiro San started about climate, do you want to say something on nuclear? Mm. So, sorry, sorry, uh, can, can you? Can uh, you yeah, uh, what is uh, Prime Minister Suga's nuclear policy? Nuclear? Nuclear, nuclear uh, reactors and all that, as part of the climate change policy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, we do, okay. Uh, uh, I do not know personally what uh, his view would be, but uh, uh, the Japanese position is uh, to pursue reactivation of uh, nuclear power plants but uh, to the extent that uh, that's not possible, uh, expand uh, uh, renewables. And uh, more emphasis, much more emphasis on renewable energy uh, development uh, uh, would, be, uh, would be made, would be necessary uh, to achieve uh, the new uh, 2050 uh, 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 carbon new, new neutrality target. Uh, but but I, I, I think uh, uh, Suga administration would make uh, 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 a reasonable effort to reactivate uh, uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, but but the government has to face the reality. It's, uh, it, it has been difficult. Uh, and if uh, it continues to be difficult, uh, uh, you know, uh, a more aggressive uh, policy would be needed to develop uh, renewables. And, and, and also, uh, just uh, I think uh, yesterday, uh, the government uh, uh, expressed uh, its intention to ban gasoline-based automobiles uh, uh, in the mid-2030s. Uh, uh, so uh, electric vehicles and hybrid uh, vehicles would be, would be encouraged. For uh, for new automobile sales, and and of course uh, electricity, uh, the source of electricity becomes an increasingly important uh, important issue, and there would be a, I think, a big shift towards renewables. Mm. And a very quick uh, follow up, uh, maybe Harukada San knows this. Uh, it was well known under Abe San that Meti was very close to the seat of power. Uh, and that included on climate change, right? Uh, oh, yeah. And that's why the action on climate, I mean, MOE could write some speeches like the Davos speech maybe, but then Meti was doing the policy making on, on energy, right? So is it the same on the Suga or is there any change? Is Meti still uh, right behind the prime minister seat or? No, mm -hmm. I don't think so. I mean, Meti was had a lot of policy inputs on in the previous administrations, but I think it has lost that uh, influence, uh, influential position. And I think Su Prime Minister Suga is more open to, I mean, it's more open to dif uh, more diverse uh, uh, policy, uh, policy experts and uh, different ministries. So I think he picks up, you know, the good ideas. <laughs> oh, and what's the power base of uh, Koizumi san, the junior? Is he, uh, you know, the, the well, Minister of Environment, right? Is he, you know, is the one who's pushing this on his own or is it Suga-san or is his star rising? Is he something significant politically? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, he's close to Suga-san and uh, he has very, uh, he is, he's surrounded by most, uh, most, I mean, probably he's surrounded, he, he, he has many policy experts around him. 
I hear a number of study groups uh, created for him, which uh, policy uh, experts uh, attend. So I think he, again, he picks up, you know, the policies which he considers, uh, he, which he likes, you know, at his discretion. And um, I think that's how he, and that Heizo Takenaka must be behind all these uh, new policy uh, initiatives, you know. Yes, that's my take. Excellent. So I know we're out of time. Uh, this was uh, an amazing exchange. Uh, thank you so much to the four of you. Those were really fascinating comments, lots of echoes. And I uh, look forward to having you back soon on this faraway shore. Um, and so we'll thank also the audience for an amazing uh, time. Um, and uh, we're going to adjourn since the time is up. Please take care of yourself in this difficult time and uh, be safe. Mm -hmm.